War's demands for increased production and for men for the armed services have made manpower in industry a major problem. This has been partially solved by at least one manufacturer by tapping an almost untouched source, handicapped men. The experience of years of rehabilitating their own employees showed that these people ask only for a chance to serve, that they quickly prove themselves above average with regard to production, safety, and absenteeism. Another important phase of such rehabilitation work is that of returning wounded soldiers to civil life. Putting them back into useful, gainful, satisfying work is a task and an obligation which this program helps fulfill. The rehabilitation program here includes not only those whose handicaps are manifested externally, but also those who have recovered from tuberculosis, heart disease, and other ailments. Already over 500 such employees have been added to the role. The usual complete medical examination given every applicant is supplemented in the case of the handicapped man by a personal interview with the medical director. The doctor, in cooperation with the personnel director, makes a careful, sympathetic analysis of the applicant's talents and abilities and places him on that job where he can serve shoulder to shoulder with his fellow workers. This man's first assignment, that of window man in a tool crib, proved him an able and willing employee. He was soon advanced to a machine as a precision tool and cutter grinder, a most important job in a factory devoted 100% to war work. Frank Rushman is another handicapped man who asks no favors. He lost his leg as an 11-year-old youngster playing around railroad yards. In spite of this, he was determined that his life should be useful and profitable. He started here doing hand and mechanical burring. As he progressed in skill and confidence, he was advanced and is now operating a gear cutting machine. By having a trade, he is forging ahead in spite of handicap. John Gagnon was a victim of polio as a child. His foot is deformed and his left leg paralyzed. However, he is able to walk with the aid of a brace. He had never done any mechanical or factory work, yet he is now doing hand and mechanical burring at a bench. Clifford Boulding had a leg amputated at the upper third of the thigh and walks with the aid of a pair of crutches. He had no industrial experience, but was hired to work on a bench and in only a few months was advanced to a straightening press. Infantile paralysis also produced a marked deformity of both of Jack Wade's legs. He is unable to walk without crutches. Yet upon completion of high school a year ago, he applied for, was assigned to, and has capably performed an important bench job in this great factory. Changes of handicapped men from one job to another are not made by supervisors without the approval of the medical department. Thus, a check is kept, and men are not placed where physical well-being or efficiency might suffer. These men neither ask for nor are given any special privileges. They receive no special rates for work performed. Yet almost without exception, they are outstanding on their job. Charlie Wall had a congenital deformity of both arms, yet neither his disposition nor his ability to do certain types of work has suffered. Charlie was an automobile salesman, but with the coming of the war, car sales became less important than war work. So Charlie applied for a job where he could help produce fighting equipment. He's a tool crib window man now, playing a real part in a huge war plant. Frank Holler has the same handicap, Yet he rides a motorcycle, drives a car or truck, and plays a trombone so well that he's performed with some of the leading dance bands of the Middle West. At the factory, his job is tool crib work, and he does it efficiently and well. This has proved to be the rule rather than the exception with most handicapped men. Here's a man who had his arm amputated at the shoulder, the result of an industrial accident in a woolen mill. He was no longer able to continue with the work he had been doing, and a period filled with odd jobs followed. When he was accepted for factory employment here, he was placed on a tool crib job. The day he received his first check, he was so thrilled that he asked to get away long enough to show it to his wife. His first goal was the payment of old debts, and today he has accomplished this and has put away a substantial nest egg besides. This ambitious and energetic employee is Joe Caldwell. Before he came to work here, he was manager of a super service station. He had lost his arm by amputation but he had never lost his pleasant disposition. His personality and willingness to work make him a valuable employee, and he will doubtless give the same splendid account of himself that's become almost traditional with such workmen. 
here's another young man who hasn't permitted a congenital deformity of the hand to hinder him in his chosen field. He finished a commercial course in school as an expert typist and was employed here as a classroom assistant in the training department. He's entirely confident of himself and realizes that he's filling an important place in the world of industry. But all isn't work with handicapped men. Joe Cage, for example, is one of the regular members of the company baseball team. He's playing with the Sunday morning league here and doing his customary good job. Early in life, he lost an arm, but his determination not to let such a handicap rule him out of the sports he loved, coupled with endless hours of practice, made a top-notch football and baseball player of him. And he's done just as good a job in the factory, for he originally started in a tool crib, working at one of the windows. It wasn't long before he was transferred to the inspection department, and recently has been advanced to the position of final inspector on the diesel engine assembly line. Lloyd Smith is another man who's had an arm amputated at the shoulder, but he hasn't let it get him down. His foreman in the reclamation department, where he's been placed as a clerk, says that he is a conscientious employee, that he always does his best and never lets his handicap bother him. Arthur Russell, while still attending high school, was involved in a train accident which resulted in the amputation of one hand. He didn't want to add to his parents' already heavy burden, so he attended business college and then went to work for a farm implement dealer. When the war cut into this business, he applied for industrial work and was given a job as a stock chaser. His artificial hand has proved no handicap, and his ambition is likely to carry him further. A few years ago, George Gottschall was a first-class Highline electrician until a hot wire falling across his arms burned them off. From the first, he was determined that he would never ask anyone for help, and he's become a capable, self-confident, reliable workman. When the war slowed down his business of cutting up and selling junk cars, he became a valuable member of the plant protection force. Blind from birth himself, George Popol derives particular satisfaction in the work he's doing to protect the eyesight of other industrial workers. Such a handicap as his often develops extreme skill and manual dexterity, and such is the case here. George is able to take safety glasses, which have been turned in for repairs, and completely overhaul and adjust them. Sometimes he finds a lens surface pitted from welding or grinding wheel sparks. Then he simply takes out the old lens and replaces it with a new one. One of the most remarkable things he can do is to tell whether the lens is clear or colored. The trick is a simple one if you've trained your fingertips to see for you. You just hold the lens over a lamp bulb and the colored glass transmits less heat than the clear one. Sherwood Poff is another man who's almost totally blind. He's an assistant to the operator on a centerless grinder. The operator first felt he'd been given an extra responsibility and burden, but Poff's willingness and sunny disposition soon won him over, and now they're an excellent team. Here is a third industrially blind man Morris Rettel. He's able to distinguish objects between himself and the light, but that's all. Before he became an employee here, he was working in a bakery. Now he's doing hand burring of gears and is fast and capable on this important work. Roy Clooney is also working on a bench doing burring on hardened transmission gears. His handicap is in his hearing and he finds it necessary to use a hearing aid. This doesn't prevent him, however, from being an entirely capable employee. His foreman's report agrees. It says he is steady, dependable, and always on the job, and is willing and anxious to cooperate with his fellow workers. Russell Burgess is the first of about 15 deaf mutes hired at this plant. Because of their happy dispositions and their willingness to cooperate, they're popular with their fellow employees and with their foremen. While most of them are on bench work, some have already been advanced to machine tools. The absorption of these handicapped men is only the beginning of a much broader program. 
As the war continues and draws to a close, soldiers like Charles Craig, who was wounded at Pearl Harbor, will come back physically handicapped. And it is the full intent and earnest desire of this company to rehabilitate them whenever and wherever possible. Charles was given the Purple Heart, our country's award for wounds received in action. He is doing useful work here now and is happy to know that he can continue the fight on the production line rather than the battle line.